Let me start by thanking uh, Stan and uh, Antonio Batro, who's not here, and the Pontifical Academy for a really interesting meeting and interesting opportunity to, to um, think about some questions that I don't even know how to uh, really begin to think about, but that I think it's important for us to be uh, thinking about. Uh, and I think these, these questions touch on a question that I care about very much, which is, um, what is it about us as a species that has enabled us to be so successful at uh, uh, learning flexibly about the world, learning to adapt to all sorts of different kinds of uh, uh, environments, but also learning rapidly uh, about the world? How can our learning be both, both um, as fast as it is and uh, ultimately as flexible as it is? And of course, a big piece of uh, uh, a, a clear manifestation of that capacity is in our capacity for creating new uh, environments and new technologies that change us and change the way that we live and so forth. And we've clearly been doing this as a species forever. In fact, the hominids, I guess, were doing this before uh, our species even came into existence. But no other animals in the world uh, create other technologies as uh, flexibly and pervasively as we do for our own benefit. So we've been doing this with old technologies. We're here to talk about new ones and a lot of the problems that Stan laid out at the beginning of this meeting uh, are specific to these new technologies which unlike all the old ones that we created uh, uh, are machines that are capable of acting on their own and also of thinking and clearly that raises a whole bunch of new problems which as I said I don't know how to think about like should we be creating these machines do we have an obligation to uh, uh, create them uh, for the uh, benefit of future generations and so forth. Uh, but one thing that struck me in thinking about the relation between our new technologies and the old ones that, that we as a species have been capable of creating forever and have uh, uh, been creating forever is that some of what look like the problematic, uh, uh, potentially problematic properties of the new technologies were already uh, there in the old ones and weren't really problematic at all. Uh, so, for example, the fact that we're capable of um, building machines that in certain local situations are better than we are uh, has always been true of our technologies, right? I mean, the reason uh, that it was useful to create bowls is that they uh, hold water. Uh, my computer is acting up here. Sorry. Uh, Uh, better than human hands can hold them. Uh, the, uh, the reason we put marks on uh, stones to indicate a number of objects is that that serves as a more enduring and reliable record of that number than human brains are able to create and so forth. So we've always been creating technologies that uh, extend beyond our own personal uh, capacities. And what's more, uh, uh, technologies that function independently of us. The whole point of a shelter is that we can be asleep and it can be doing uh, work for us while we're sleeping. So I think in that way, there's some old questions that we can ask that may be relevant in this new uh, context to thinking about new technologies. Um, what has made us so good uh, in the past uh, at remaking our world uh, for our own benefit, creating new technologies that have been able to do work for us. And can we draw on insights from that in, uh, in thinking about how we can uh, uh, harness these abilities going forward uh, to deal with the new challenges that our new technologies are facing? So those are the questions I want to focus on today. Um, treating our new technologies as we treat our old ones, as tools for us to use to be enhancing our lives and asking how can we go about um, uh, best doing that. Now, the piece of this uh, question uh, that touches on my own work uh, is the piece that has to do with human psychology, right? With what, what is it about our minds that allow us uh, to uh, uh, reshape our world for our benefit? And my way of trying to get some insight into that is uh, comes from a kind of I think what looks like a very unlikely corner, uh, doing extremely low-tech experiments on extremely young and inexperienced uh, human beings, uh, these uh, young infants, who we can study through very simple behavioral uh, uh, experiments where we look at very simple indicator responses like what they look at. 
um, will they look more at a sequence of triangles that are changing in shape relative to a sequence of triangles that are changing in orientation and size but not changing in shape, for example. Um, and by doing experiments like that, try to map out what are the capacities of infants for taking in information uh, and um, making sense of what goes on uh, around them. And then trying to use that work to, to uh, see what light we can shed on our own capacities for doing these things. Now studies of infants in themselves can't answer that question, uh, but if you have lots of friends who study uh, different populations and use different methods to do that, I think you can make headway on this problem. For example, you can look uh, at cognitive capacities across human development and ask what are the basic building block abilities and, uh, uh, that we have that we find at all ages that are present in infants and remain present in us uh, throughout life and do work for us throughout life. Uh, you can study people in different cultures and ask how flexible are our cognitive capacities by asking what kinds of different environments have we been able to adapt to. Um, and also, what are our deepest capacities, our most universal capacities that look the same across all of these uh, different environments? I think we can also learn a lot by comparing human cognitive abilities to the uh, uh, abilities of other animals, asking in what ways do other animals go about solving problems similarly to us or even the sa in the same ways as we do and in what ways are they different. Where we find that they're different, we get clues to what's unique about us. Where we find that they're similar, we get tools for probing those capacities that of course are far more powerful than anything that we could do uh, with a human infant and that allows for a multi-leveled study uh, of uh, human cognition from genes to neurons to um, uh, computations. So that's the whole general picture. Uh, what do I distill from that, from the research on infants? That in addition to being uh, endowed at birth with a set of sensory capacities and perceptual capacities and action capacities, we're also endured, uh, endowed with um, some more central and abstract capacities for making sense of the world. And in particular, there are six of them that have been uh, interesting me. Uh, one is a capacity for uh, parsing the arrays around us into objects, bodies that are internally connected and that behave as wholes and reasoning about uh, uh, those bodies and their interactions. Uh, second, for distinguishing inanimate objects from animate uh, agents that act on the world and cause changes in the world and uh, making sense of their uh, actions. I think there's a third system separate from the agent system, though I won't argue that here, uh, for singling out a subset of the animate beings in the world that we see as relevantly similar to ourselves and as potential communicative partners and social partners that we can learn uh, from and engage with. Uh, and a system for representing shapes that's going to enter a little into um, uh, 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 today's talk about um, uh, tools and, and uh, technology. And two other systems I won't talk about at all uh, today. One that ca captures other aspects of the geometry of the environment that we use for navigating and a system of uh, number. Now I think each of these systems, when, as we study it in human infants and compare what infants can do to other animals, uh, we get strong evidence that none of these systems is unique to our species. They're all shared by uh, other animals, some of them very broadly shared by a wide array of animals. These are systems that evolved before we did um, and that we got for free when we came along um, uh, able to uh, learn and uh, create new knowledge systems. Now studies of other animals provide the clearest evidence, I think, that these systems are innate uh, because you can do controlled rearing studies, for example, on a chick or on a fish and ask when, you, when, they, when they see uh, a triangle for the very first time, okay, they've, 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 they've been in a dark rearing experiment, they've come out of the egg and you show, them, you show them a triangle, what kind of information can they extract from it? We get evidence, I think, uh, for abilities to represent objects and agents and forms and, and uh, so forth in these other animals at birth. So these are, these are um, uh, uh, capacities that are innate. But equally important, they're extremely limited capacities. The, the uh, form perception of an inexperienced chick or a very young infant uh, is radically less powerful than uh, uh, our 
uh, the, the representations of geometrical forms that, that uh, we can form as adults, much less the, kind, the kinds of geometric, abstract geometrical reasoning that we can engage in. These are very limited systems, and I think that makes them really useful for trying to figure out what are these basic cognitive building blocks that, that can be brought to the table for developing the kinds of elaborate systems of knowledge that uh, we see later in development. Um, these systems also, this is important, uh, are present throughout life. Clearly some of the things that we find in infants are just scaffolding that are there to get the infant, to keep the infant alive until tomorrow when they'll start getting in the business of learning some uh, more complicated things. But for every one of these systems, we find evidence that these systems are both present and functional in us as adults. So they're not simply scaffolding that we're uh, kicking away, they're, they're abilities that we continue to have. And Moreover, we have them in part because they serve as foundations for the later developing uniquely human uh, abilities that aren't yet there uh, in the infants. We draw on these systems when we create new things, uh, and I think we draw on them uh, as well. This will be my thesis for today. Uh, when we um, turn to the task of develop crafting tools um, and developing uh, technologies. So, uh, what are these systems? What kind of evidence do we get for them? How do they work? Uh, one slide on uh, the object system. Uh, babies are pretty good at perceiving objects in visual arrays when those objects move. So uh, if a, an object with visible ends but an occluded center moves back and forth be, uh, behind an occluder, babies will use that pattern of common motion to perceive that object as connected behind the occluder. And you can show that ability through really simple experiments where you just bore the babies with that object moving back and forth and then ask uh, when you take the occluder away, what is it they've been bored with, and they'll continue to be bored by a connected object and look longer at a display presenting the same visible surfaces with a gap between them. Similarly, you can ask whether babies uh, perceive an object as persisting when it moves fully out of view by boring them with a display like that, uh, and then presenting them with an array containing either a single continuously moving object or multiple objects. In that case, they'll be more interested if there are multiple objects than if there's a single one. Uh, but if you do a variation on that experiment where you present motion on the two sides but nothing in the middle, they show a different pattern now. They expect to see two objects and are more interested if you show them just one. Uh, experiments by uh, Rene Bayer-Jean has asked what happens when objects move fully out of sight. Can infants maintain representations of them and use them to make predictions about what visible things in an array will do? So uh, in her uh, original experiments now conducted a long time ago, she presented babies simply with a screen that rotated upward back and forth 180 degrees on a, on a surface with nothing behind it. Then she presented an object behind the screen, rotated the screen upward till the object was fully hidden and asked uh, babies in effect what did they expect uh, to happen. And what they expected is that the screen would stop at the point where it got to the object. They showed this uh, by looking much longer if the screen underwent the full rotation through the position where the object uh, had, had been standing, showing both that they can represent the hidden object and that they're expecting that objects are going to interact with each other in particular ways that object now hidden would constrain the motion of the uh, visible one. Now, uh, one of the, I think, most important things that have come out of these experiments is not these abilities that babies show, but the limits to the abilities that they show. Let me just uh, share a few of them with you. First of all, if you present babies with a same simple center occluded object with no motion, they are completely agnostic as to whether that object is connected or not uh, in the places where it's hidden. Uh, equally interested when you take that occluder away, when you present a connected object versus um, two separated objects. Uh, second, Jan already uh, mentioned uh, these experiments by, uh, by Bayer Jean. If you present babies with a simple event in which uh, one object, that smiley face, is placed on top of another, if it's placed stably supported, they expect it to stay there, but they also expect it to stay there if it's placed just on the edge of the object, at least the youngest uh, infants that uh, Bayer-Jean tested did. What's more, if you don't show them the placement of the smiley face object on the other object, you simply present the two objects to infants and ask babies how many things are there. Uh, until the age of about six months, infants are 
quite neutral on the question whether there's one object or two in that scene. And interestingly, uh, Fei Shu and Susan Carey showed that even if you present babies up to 10 months of age with two objects that they're familiar with, uh, like a train which if, uh, or a truck, which if you presented it alone, the baby would go vroom vroom and try to drive it around. When you present them one on top of the other like that and ask them uh, how many objects are in this scene, what's going to move together as I move something in this scene by grabbing the head of the duck and lifting it into the air, the babies are quite neutral on the question whether the truck should rise with the duck uh, or whether the duck should uh, move on its own. In this situation where uh, the two displays, were the, the, uh, the duck and the truck were simply stationary with no motion at all at the time that the uh, question was asked. On the other hand, if the duck uh, it slides a little across the truck, now they know that uh, they should move separately. And final example uh, of a limit, another um, famous experiment by uh, Xu and Carey, in which they took um, uh, two simple and familiar and quite different looking from one, one another objects, a ball and a duck, and alternately brought each of those objects out from behind a screen on opposite sides of the screen. Uh, the first thing they showed is that infants up to about 10 months of age are quite sensitive to the fact that those two objects look different and they can compare them to each other. Uh, so uh, when they alternately bring out a ball on one side and a duck on the other side, babies look at that display more than if you simply bring out the duck on both sides or the ball on both sides. So they're detecting the feature differences. But when they further ask infants how many objects are behind uh, that screen, how many objects are participating in this event, by after bringing out the ball and put, take, putting it back and bringing out the duck and putting it back, now removing the screen, the babies look equally when what they see on removal of the screen is one object versus two, up to 10 months of age, okay? I think that's a really big clue that there's, there's a serious limit to the system. And as a first pass, this isn't the full story, but as a first pass, what it's looking like is that babies are really only using patterns of motion uh, in figuring out what's connected to what in the scene, what's going to persist over time, what are the bodies out there that are going to be interacting with each other. Now, an interesting thing here, though, is that the objects that they're reasoning about are all inanimate objects. They're not moving on their own. And uh, the abilities, the positive abilities that babies are showing, they're showing even as newborn infants, they themselves aren't capable of reaching for and grasping objects until they're four or five months of age. So if they're using motion to be learning about objects early on, most likely it's because there's other people around them that are acting on those objects and moving them for them. Uh, hence the next question, what do infants understand about agents, these creatures with causal powers who can generate their own motion uh, and produce changes uh, in the world. And uh, a fair amount has been learned uh, about that through studies of young infants. None of this work uh, is my own, but let me cheerlead for it uh, for a minute. Uh, one thing that's been uh, shown is that when babies, I didn't put a picture of this up there, but when babies see an event in which one inanimate object moves behind a screen in the direction of a second object that's partly visible, uh, partly hidden behind that screen that's stationary. If the second object subsequently begins to move, the infants infer that the first object contacted it, uh, caused it to move by uh, coming into contact with it. And that's been shown by studies where you bore babies with that event and then take the screen away and alternately show them events where the first object contacts the second and the first object stops short of the second. Uh, they, they're more interested if it stops short of the second, suggesting that they inferred that the two objects would contact each other. But when you repeat this experiment, uh, showing babies people instead of inanimate objects. Now they no longer infer that the second object moved out of the, the, the second person moved out of the way on contact with the first person. The second person can move out of the way on their own. Okay, so that inference about contact is suspended in the case where the two objects are people. Uh, now, if the first object is a person and the second object is an inanimate object, uh, Paul Muttner and, and Susan Carey showed the infants do infer contact between those two objects. Interestingly, if the first object is inanimate and the second object is a person, then whether or not the infants infer contact depends on whether that second 
person is facing in the direction of the inanimate object or not. So when they are, they, uh, when they're facing in that direction, they do not infer contact. When they're not facing in that direction, they do, suggesting that infants are representing what's perceptually accessible to agents and using that to predict what actions those agents are likely to uh, engage in. And further evidence, uh, clearer evidence actually, uh, that infants are sensitive to the, pers the uh, perceptual uh, perspectives of other agents comes from research by Yu, Yu Yan Luo, conducted with infants as young as three months of age, showing that if, if infants see an agent uh, who has uh, visual access to two objects and the agent reaches for one of them, they infer that that agent has a preference for that object. But if one of those two objects is occluded from the perspective of the agent, though not from the perspective of the infant, they don't make that uh, inference. Uh, so uh, sensitivity to visual perspective from an early age. Uh, now, what do uh, infants expect agents to do with the objects that are perceptually accessible to them? They uh, seem to expect them to engage in object-directed, goal-directed actions. Uh, this is uh, classic work by Amanda Woodward showing that if you repeatedly show a baby an agent reaching for one of two objects and then you uh, exchange the positions of those two objects, they don't uh, represent as the same action a reach on the same trajectory to the same endpoint. Rather, they represent as the same action a reach to the same object. So uh, uh, after being bored with reaching to the ball in the top of those three events, babies uh, generalize that boredom to the bottom event, novel trajectory, same goal object relative to the middle event where there's um, same trajectory but a novel uh, goal object. And then finally, uh, work that uh, Josh mentioned uh, yesterday, Shari Liu in my lab, uh, building on findings uh, uh, from Georgi uh, Gergay uh, Ger uh, uh, Ger and, and uh, Chibra, um, has shown that infants expect agents to act in a way that minimizes the cost of their actions or the effort, or in this case, the length of the path that they'll take uh, in undertaking that action. So in these studies, infants are familiarized, uh, see repeatedly events in which that um, orange uh, uh, animated character with a face uh, jumps over a barrier to get to a goal object, a relatively tall barrier, and then are tested with um, events involving a shorter barrier, and the question is, how is that agent going to jump and they expect the agent to take a novel trajectory to get to that object more efficiently than they otherwise would. Um, and she's also recently shown um, with uh, Tomer, Ullman, uh, uh, and Josh and me that uh, if you see that an agent is willing to take uh, or takes a greater cost to get to one object than another, they infer that the agent uh, values the object for which, uh, more highly the object for which they took a greater cost. So this agent has jumped over a medium-sized barrier but refused a high barrier to get to the uh, yellow triangle but only jumped over a low barrier, refusing a middle-sized barrier to get to the blue object. And uh, they infer that in the future, both objects present on a level playing field, as it were, that agent's gonna go for the one for which they previously took uh, a higher cost. Uh, finally, uh, uh, final uh, uh, bit of uh, background information. Uh, we know that by observing other people, infants learn not only about the goals of those people and their perceptual perspectives and uh, the actions that they're likely to take, they also use the actions of other people to learn about objects. So as I said, they're perceiving objects from patterns of motion and that's almost always gonna be motion that's been produced by other people uh, uh, in those critical first few months. Uh, but lots of work by other people have shown that infants will also use other people's states of attention and goal-directed action uh, to uh, uh, direct their attention to objects that might potentially be interesting to them. So in Kylie Hamlin's studies, uh, after showing babies repeatedly that this person is reaching for one of two objects, she now leaves the scene and the babies have a choice of what, uh, uh, what they should do. Uh, 
these babies uh, now beyond five months of age, so they're able to reach for things, will tend to reach for the object that they previously saw the agent reaching for. And um, long-standing work by uh, Andy Meltzoff and other people have shown that infants will also tend to look at objects that they've seen other people looking at. So they're using other people's actions as a source of information about what's potentially interesting in the world. They also, uh, again, work by Meltzoff, use other people's actions as a source of information about what actions might be worth their while to be under taking. These are these classic studies showing even newborn infants tending to reproduce the facial gestures and in other work the uh, hand motions of the uh, actors uh, who are facing them. And of course, from birth, infants are tend uh, attending to other people's voices, starting to decipher what other people are saying and relating from three months of age, relating other people's speech to the objects around them. Uh, so Sandy Waxman has shown infants are more likely to categorize a set of objects together uh, at three months of age if they're accompanied by the same uh, speech sound. Uh, and by six months of age, uh, Elika Bergelson, Dan Swingley have shown that infants are starting to relate uh, uh, actual words uh, to their referent objects if they hear uh, the word apple while, in a, in, while being shown a visual array containing a bunch of objects, including an apple. They're somewhat more likely at six months of age already uh, to turn to look at that apple. This is although infants don't actually start getting actively in the business of producing language or responding to expressions beyond single isolated words until the end of the uh, first year. So I think this work raises all kinds of interesting questions that uh, uh, interdisciplinary collaborative work, especially uh, uh, collaborations between people building uh, smart machines and uh, people studying smart infants, can start to ask about uh, what, how are these systems working? I mean, I think there's, I don't think it's an imponderable mystery as, as was suggested yesterday, but I think there are really serious questions, empirical questions here of how do you grow minds that are able to construe the world in the ways that we see uh, infants construing it, uh, at what accounts for the abilities they have, and also what accounts for the limits. Uh, uh, can we use those limits to try to figure out something about how these systems are working? Here I think there's already evidence, um, I'm here drawing on insights from uh, uh, Tomer Ullman uh, and Josh, that work in computer science can be really helpful in trying to think about why would you build babies with these peculiar pr performance profiles that we see when we do these behavioral experiments. So one thing we learn uh, uh, from work in uh, computer graphics and work on physics engines is that uh, it's useful to represent objects at multiple levels of uh, resolution. Representations of the coarse shapes of objects may be the most economical and useful ways of um, uh, representing objects' paths of motion and making predictions about when are things going to collide with each other and what kinds of forces are making inferences about what kinds of forces are operating on a scene. Um, but for purposes of actually determining whether the thing you're looking at now uh, has changed relative to what you saw before, we also can associate with each of these coarse bodies that we're representing in a scene, much more fine-grained information about its shape. And I think maybe the puzzle of how could it be at one and the same time that a young baby can be sensitive to the featural differences between the ball and the duck in that shoe carry experiment, uh, and yet blind to, you know, not use that information to be, to be asking, is that thing that appeared on the right the same body as what appeared on the left, that maybe this, um, a uh, smart system for capitalizing on different kinds of shape representations for different purposes uh, could uh, give us uh, clues to an answer, uh, an understanding of why they're doing that. However, none of what I've told you about so far gets to, uh, uh, as I'm almost running out of time, uh, gets to the crucial question here of what accounts for our capacity for uh, uh, building tools and moving uh, human cognition in, in our species' unique directions. So for that, I just want to talk about some work um, that uh, Shu and Carrie did going beyond the capacities of the 10-month-old infants to look at uh, and revealing, I think, a really interesting change that takes place at the end of the first year. So, as I said, 10-month-old infants are indeterminate as to whether they are those uh, displays involve uh, only 
uh, a single object, a duck truck or a duck ball, uh, or two distinct objects at 10 months, but by 12 months they very clearly uh, parse them into uh, two distinct objects. Interestingly, they don't simply do that uh, by blindly comparing the shapes of those objects, because if you present infants with two objects that differ in shape, but that we would call by the same name, uh, a sippy cup uh, and a, uh, a teacup, uh, infants don't uh, represent two objects under that uh, circumstance. What's more, uh, if uh, uh, instead of testing 10 and 12 month old infants uh, on the two sides of this change, you test 11 month old infants with objects whose names are known uh, to some of the infants but not others. It turns out it's the infants who know the names of these objects who succeed at this task uh, relative uh, to the ones who don't. So this ability seems to be coinciding in time uh, with uh, object naming. Uh, and that raises the question whether the naming is actually doing work for the infants and further experiments by Fei Xu shows that it, uh, show that it does. Uh, in these studies, she takes nine month old uh, infants. So they're already in the business of starting to learn words, but they're not actually using them yet, nor would they spontaneously use them in this task. But if she now labels the objects for the infant, now they expect two objects at nine months of age if they're labeled with different names, not if they're labeled uh, uh, with the uh, same noun. What's more, the names don't have to be names of meaningful objects and the objects don't have to be familiar. Uh, if you use two novel objects and novel nouns, again, at, at nine months of age, infants will represent two distinct objects if they're given different labels. Interestingly though, uh, in light of what Laura was talking about on emotion, uh, it's not just any old distinctive vocalizations that will work here. So they have a condition where they bring out new objects and in one case go, ooh, ah, and in the other case, ooh, yuck. Uh, yet infants don't, in that case, infer that there's two distinct objects there, only when they're given uh, different names. So it looks like naming is influencing um, infants' object representations. They went on to ask, uh, what information attaches to the name at this point in development at nine months? So very quickly, um, one source of information concerns where one object um, ends and the next begins. So if you present an ambiguous array of, that could be two objects or could be one object composed of two parts, um, and uh, 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 while you present that object, you say, look, a blicket, a toma, or look, a blicket, a blicket. In the first case, uh, infants expect uh, two objects and show that by looking longer if you lift the top and the whole thing moves as a whole. In the second case where you use just one name, they show the opposite expectation. So they're expecting each name to refer to a distinct body. They also expect each name to refer to a distinct shape. They showed this in studies where they brought out a succession of boxes, all of which contain two objects, uh, sometimes of the same shape, sometimes of different shape, and then presented a new box. And without showing the objects, they looked in the box and either uh, uh, gave two different object names or the same object name twice, and then asked kids, uh, do you expect two objects of the same shape or of different shapes? They expected two different shapes in the case of two different names, uh, not otherwise. Finally, what about object functions? So there have been lots of studies showing that when people in, perform distinct actions on objects causing distinct effects, uh, infants will learn about that uh, in the first year. So they capitalized on this to present two objects that looked the same, but when an actor picked an object up and turned it over, uh, for some pairs of objects, the two objects made the same sound and for other pairs of objects, they made different sounds. Uh, and then they presented a new pair of objects and went, ooh, look, a blicket, a toma, or ooh, look, a blicket, a blicket. And in the case where they used two different words, the infants expected uh, different sounds. In the other case, they, uh, they didn't. So what's going on here? Um, I think that somewhere between nine and 12 months of age, infants are coming to um, master expressions, uh, simple noun phrases uh, that, that pick out individual objects as instances of a kind. So they're coming to, uh, to the point where when presented with an expression like here's a cup, um, they expect to see a body whose uh, structure will exhibit certain specific distinctive uh, uh, dedicated uh, functions. Now, uh, 
Cups aren't the only things that infants are talking about. In early speech, we see three kinds of common nouns. Uh, nouns for kinds of uh, artifact objects like cups, nouns for animals, and uh, nouns for uh, body parts. Notice that in all three of these cases, what these words seem to refer to are a conjunction of uh, physical body, uh, with a dedicated shape that allows for certain specific functions. If it's an animal, it's functions for the animal itself. If it's a body part, it's functions for the possessor of that body part. If it's an artifact object, it's functions for the user of that artifact and the um, designer uh, uh, who created it for that, uh, for that purpose. Now, Humans aren't the only creatures who can form these uh, connections of uh, bodies with uh, shapes and dedicated functions. Chicks show this ability when they uh, imprint to an object that's moved around and, and uh, ever thereafter follow that object as uh, mom. Pavlov's dog showed that ability when the dog learned slowly over time to associate these different properties with each other. What I think is different about children in this case is that they're linking these uh, representations productively. The very first time that they hear a word picking out, you know, in the right kind of grammatical context, picking out an object of a uh, particular kind. They're linking these productively. Um, and by doing this, I think this kind of representation allows older children to see every object as potentially an instance of uh, a given new kind. The very first time uh, it's uh, exhibited. So as was pointed out earlier, this isn't the first experience of the world the infants have had uh, by any means, uh, but the very first time they experience a cup or a cat or something like that without any prior experience with an object of that category, they're able to generalize once they have this uh, system in place. I think that's what the experiments on the nine-month-old infants with the novel objects and the novel nouns are, are showing. So what I think we have here is a case of really rapid, flexible, smart learning. And one of the things that makes it smart is of course adults talk, we talk about the things that we find interesting and useful. Uh, and children learn uh, words in relation to the frequency with which they hear them from the adults who are talking about them for that reason. So language, I think, serves as a really useful filter on what's worth learning about. Of all the uh, gazillions of possible concepts that our productively combinatorial minds could form, which are the ones worth having? Language is a really good source of information about that, and the kids are using it early on. I think I, I would submit this as a possible basis for the talent for technology that puts us in the position that we're in, in this meeting, in thinking about how to use these technologies going forward. Well, I'm out of towns, uh, time, so, um, uh, let me uh, skip my uh, summary and go on to uh, two uh, final questions. First question is, can AI learn from studies of cognitive development? I don't know, uh, but I think there are three uh, possible ways. One that's been talked about a lot, of course, infants are, uh, Laura talked about this, uh, infants are uh, great learners, maybe there, there'll be um, insights to come from that. A second, which was mentioned uh, by Jan yesterday, is that one of the things we want our smart machines to do is to be able to deal with people. To do that, we need to, they need to understand how people work. Maybe the work on cognitive development can be helpful in guiding that understanding Understanding. But I want to end by focusing on the third, which is that if the long-term goal of AI is to make our lives better, then I think we need a deeper understanding of ourselves and our own capacities, both our flexibility and also the foundational building block abilities that make that flexibility possible. If we're going to design machines that are going to be good for us over long time scales as well as uh, shorter ones. Now, I think that Meeting that last goal is going to require more than intuition and a, um, our current understanding. I think we're, we're going to need a new research enterprise to do this. I think this is what uh, Stephen Hawking was uh, calling for, and I think he's right. Uh, if we're going to design machines that are going to be good for us. Uh, so maybe I'll skip my prediction failures. Let me just say that despite having worked on infants for uh, uh, 30 years, I think I've made all kinds of wrong predictions about what new technologies were going to do for us. I thought, for example, that um, having uh, 
all of uh, the world's uh, great libraries accessible to anybody who can get uh, on the internet was going to bring about a great convergence in human knowledge and deeper understanding across people because we'd all have access to the same information. I think it's pretty clear from uh, the U.S. election, if not other things, that that's not how things have turned out. Um, I also worried, uh, just to skip to example three, that putting touch screens in the hands of babies would be really bad for them. It would screw up their sense of the physical world, and I think that is not the case either. I don't think it's had any kind of bad effects like that. So uh, what I take from this is I don't think at this state of knowledge we know enough to be able to know wh how, what the impacts of new technologies are going to be. Now, in the past, I don't think this was a terrible problem because one could take a wait and see attitude, right? One could say, let's develop a new, let's, let's, let's build a bowl and let's see what we can do with it and we can see whether our neighbors build a better bowl. Uh, um, and one of the things that made a wait and see attitude possible was that the objects that we built had single specific dedicated functions. They appeared in particular places at particular times and they spread and changed slowly over generations. One thing that I think is different today is that we're designing artifacts that have multiple functions. So when you see they're having an effect on people, it's not clear what function is uh, doing the uh, work there. Uh, they're spreading all over the world uh, uh, incredibly rapidly, and they're also changing all of the time so that it becomes hard to even track what the long-term effects of uh, uh, artifacts like that might be. Uh, so I think old ways of adapting to new technologies may not uh, uh, be an, uh, an option, and that instead we really need to think about the kind of research that we could undertake to ask, um, what kinds of tasks do we want our new technologies to do? Um, in what kinds of situations are they going to improve our lives and how might we get into trouble? Um, and uh, how can we use new technologies to enhance our development as a species, starting already with children? So let me, this is my last slide. Let me just end with um, one last example of uh, what a, a, a research project that I think is doable and worth doing, uh, maybe even uh, important to do, if we want to understand how to foster our talents in general and our talent for technology in particular. So this is a cover from uh, The New Yorker from two years ago, around this time of year, just a little bit later, Christmas shopping time. Uh, two different environments in which two different people are uh, shopping for Christmas presents. The person living at the bottom is surrounded by, bathed in 20th century technology, right? Individual artifacts with specific dedicated functions, and he's gone out to a store and bought some more for people. Uh, the person on top has a laptop. That's basically it. Uh, in this beautifully aesthetic uh, spare environment, and she seems to be shopping online maybe for video games or applications of various uh, kinds uh, uh, to be giving to her friends. Here's the question I want to ask. Uh, let's uh, have these not be lone people living in their own uh, one-person apartments, uh, but members of families that children are growing into and uh, going to be coping with and uh, uh, learning in, and ask, what's a baby going to learn in each of these environments? An environment in which the structures and functions of uh, artifacts are uh, radically uh, hidden uh, from view. Uh, a person simply taps on a screen or swipes at it, and any number of different functions can be uh, taking place versus one where they're more evident, like the environments that the babies in all the experiments I described to you uh, were living in. What are babies going to learn about objects in these different environments? What are they going to learn about people and uh, uh, their actions? And what kinds of talents and interests might they gain in these different in, uh, environments? I don't know the answer to this question. I mean, for all I know, the environment at the top may be a far better environment for equipping babies with the kind of world uh, that our technologies are going to be uh, creating for them. I think that's a possibility. I think another possibility is that the environment at the bottom will be a better one for getting our talents for technology going. It's an environment more like the environments in which um, our uh, systems for representing objects and people and for learning uh, from other people evolved in. 
And I also think there's a third possibility, which is really what one wants is dedicated places and times where one is living in the world at the bottom and, and, and uh, in which one is living in the world uh, at the top. What I think is a complete non-starter is the recommendation that was given uh, by the American Academy of Pediatrics, which is parents, you can play with your smartphones all you want, but keep them away from your kids. Uh, and they recommended this precisely at the age where kids are most focused on the actions and objects that other people are engaged with. Uh, I'm horrified at the thought that the parent is there engaged with the smartphone and then virtuously uh, keeping it away from the child so that they can't be sharing those activities together. But mostly I think we need research uh, to be uh, addressing these questions. Thank you. Thank you.